Hey, a quick message for those of you who are listening to this episode on Spotify. I have a small favor to ask. Spotify now allows mobile users to rate podcasts. I would really appreciate it if you can take a quick pause to go to the Tech Lead Journal podcast page and leave your favorite show, your best rating, on Spotify. It will help me a lot to get this podcast to reach more people on the platform. Thanks a lot. Great resignation has a lot to do with autonomy, competence, and social inclusion, which, when fully met, promote our well-being at work and positively influence our behavior. Today, employees want more autonomy, e.g. work-life balance and working from home. And at the same time, they want more social inclusion. Additionally, recruiting should provide as many authentic insights into the company and the new job as possible. So it's also important that candidates interact quickly with their new colleagues in order to feel socially integrated. Hey everyone. My name is Henry Surya Wirawan, and you're listening to the Tech Lead Journal podcast, the show where I'll be bringing you the greatest technical leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders in the industry to discuss about their journey, ideas, and practices that we all can learn and apply to build a highly performing technical team and to make an impact in your personal work. So let's dive into our journal. Hello again to all of you, my friends and listeners. Welcome to the Tech Lead Journal podcast, the show where you can learn about technical leadership and excellence from my conversations with great thought leaders. Thank you for tuning in today, listening to this episode. If this is your first time listening to Tech Lead Journal, subscribe and follow the show on your podcast app and social media on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you are a regular listener and enjoy listening to the episodes, will you subscribe as a patron at techleadjournal.dev slash patron and support my journey to continue producing great Tech Lead Journal episodes every week. Hiring people can be challenging, especially in a fast-growing companies and startups. Finding the right talents who are suitable with the company culture and retaining them are some key areas that are always top of the mind for hiring managers and recruiters. After the pandemic, the hiring landscape also changes drastically with more employees looking for remote work and flexible working arrangements. The great resignation is also an ongoing trend in some parts of the world with job dissatisfaction mentioned as one of the top reasons why people are quitting their jobs. My guest for today's episode is Jens Olberding. Jens is the author of Agile Recruiting and an expert in Agile HR management. In this episode, we open our conversation discussing the great resignation trend and some of its underlying reasons. Jens then shared the concept of agile recruiting and explained how it is very much relevant to the latest changes in the current job landscape. He emphasized that recruiting should not only put focus just on the hiring department's needs, but also equally on the candidates to understand better what they truly want from their career. Jens also shared a few recruiting best practices such as getting the recruiting team's involvements in the recruitment process, building cross-functional teams, and an interesting Zuzi Ball interview technique that he shared towards the end that we can use to assess candidates' behaviors and competencies better. I enjoyed my conversation with Jens, discussing about hiring best practices, latest hiring trends, and the concept of agile recruiting that can help us to hire in such a complex and uncertain world. If you also enjoy and find this episode useful, help me share it with your friends and colleagues who would also benefit from listening to this episode. Leave a rating and review on your podcast app and share some comments or feedback about this episode on your social media. It is my ultimate mission to make this podcast available to more people and I need your help to support me towards fulfilling my mission. Before we continue to the conversation, let's hear some words from our sponsor. Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Skills Matter, the global community and events platform with more than 100,000 software professionals. Here, members can organize their learning experiences around the technology topics they care about most. You get on-demand access to their latest content, thought leadership insights, as well as the exciting schedule of tech events running across all time zones. So whether DevOps or data science is your buzz, or you're a fan of functional programming or all things cloud, 
you can make real connections with people who share your interests. Head on over to skillsmatter.com to become part of the tech community that matters most to you. It's free to join and you will find it easy to keep up with the latest tech trends. Hello everyone, welcome back to another new episode of the Techly Journal podcast. Today I have a different type of guest with me today. His name is Jens Alberding. He's actually an expert in agile HR management. So as you can guess, probably we are going to talk a lot more about recruiting today, which is probably one of the hottest topic in the engineering out there because we are always recruiting. Jens actually just released a book and it's all about agile recruiting. So again, today we'll be covering a lot about what is agile recruiting. How can you actually use that concept to help you in hiring engineers? Welcome to the show, Jens. Really looking forward for this conversation. Hi, Henry. Thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to be at the Techie Journal. So I'm happy to be here. So Jens, in the beginning, maybe if you can introduce yourself, tell us more about your career journey or highlight turning points so that we can also understand where you are coming from. Okay. Yeah, as I mentioned, I'm an HR guy. I live in Germany, close to this border. My whole career, I always worked as an HR guy. I started as a headhunter. Later on, I worked as an HR business partner. And the very last years, I worked agile transformation manager stuff. In 2017, I founded my own company called Läuft. It's a German word and it's not so easy to explain the meaning in English, but it's something like, don't worry, everything is good or everything's on a good way. Läuft, it works. One of my biggest projects so far is with a German automotive manufacturer where we do some transformation stuff from the classical way of engineering to the e-mobility, as it's a big topic. They also do the e-mobility part and in great agile corporate culture things, new leadership skills and so on. That's kind of the record of all things I do, identifying and developing people's skills and competences. And that's how my book Agile Recruiting came about. It's about empowering people to make a better selection process and, of course, about correctly identifying the skills of applicants, a more self-organization and competence-based selection process. Thanks so much for your introduction. So I don't know how to pronounce the company name, but I like the meaning of it. Like everything is going to be okay. <laughs> That's kind of like very assuring. So before we move on to our actual topic, I want to discuss one phenomenon that is also quite widely published. It's called the Great Resignation, maybe predominantly happening in the Western side of the world, but I can also see some parts of Asia also kind of like following the trend somehow due to the pandemic, maybe. Maybe can tell us more, what do you think is happening here? Why there this phenomenon of Great Resignation? I guess the Great Resignation has a lot to do with autonomy, competence, and social inclusion which when fully met, promote our well-being at work and positively influence our behavior. Today, employees want more autonomy, e.g. work-life balance and working from home. And at the same time, they want more social inclusion. So the best of the pre-COVID time to meet real people in real life with real coffee and the part from working from home have a better work-life balance, which due to COVID we are able to work more from home. So our recruiting this meant that companies definitely need to offer flexible work hours and remote work. So that's a must. Additionally, recruiting should provide as many authentic insights into the company as a new job as possible for the social inclusion. So it's also important that candidates interact quickly with their new colleagues in order to feel socially integrated. Team building process in the selection process. So you mentioned a couple of very interesting things, right? Because you mentioned all these attributes that probably people are looking like psychological safety or social inclusion, work-life balance, working from home, flexible working hours. So all this seems to be quite a trend these days. Do you see this kind of change of what people really want from a job actually affecting the recruitment process or maybe from the company's point of view, what do they need to think about now in order not to get affected by many people resigning from the company? First of all, you have to offer flexible work hours and remote work. So you have to do that. If it's possible in any way, you have to do it. If you run a hotel, it will be hard to do remote work. You need your staff at your hotel. But for all work where remote work is possible, you have to find a way how you can fulfill the need of social inclusion. How can you manage the day working at home? 
maybe you start to do more team events or bring people together and a real experience to be part of a team of a company. So you have to spend more time and more effort to connect people and bring them in a discussion to make them feel as a team, to make them feel welcome and successful in what they do. How about in terms of the recruitment process itself? I know like these are the benefits that you will offer, but is there any significant difference in terms of recruitment process due to the great resignation? Maybe that it's more common to do video calls than interviews in person. That's one part. It's easy to fix to do more Zoom calls than real interviews in person. But I guess it's also helpful to integrate the team from the department who's looking for a new employee to involve this team in the recruiting process to connect them. That's a way for the candidate to know the colleagues of the future. How do these people look like? How do I like them? How well do I fit in? Do they give me the feeling of being part of a team? So it's more important to connect people on the same level. So it's not so important that the HR guy is in the interview because normally it's not the person you will work with. After that interview or after the recruitment process, normally you won't see your recruiter again. So it seems that when you say that the team themselves now needs to be involved in the process, maybe helping to interview, those are like some of the concepts from the agile recruiting, because I had a chance to take a look at the book. But for people who are not yet familiar about this whole concept of agile recruiting, can you probably explain to us what is actually agile recruiting? Is it just recruitment traditionally plus agile process that it becomes agile recruiting or essentially there's something different underneath it? I put agile in recruiting because it means that HR is aligning itself even more closely with the customer. That's a typical agile thing to focus on the customer. For HR, it's always a question, who's the customer? Is it the department or is it the applicant? So maybe they had two customers, but first and almost it's always the role of HR to supporting the department in all tasks. That's why there's an HR department, it's a service department to support for the other departments. One of the biggest challenge for every department is finding new employees. So that's one of the biggest tasks HR has to help their first most important customer. If you look at what applicants want today, it's a transparent insight into the company and the task, what they have to do, but also into the culture of the company and the team they are applying to. So first of all, HR has to help the department who's looking for new employee mm -hmm. and has to focus on the applicants. What do they want? What's the big changes in the great resignation? How can we connect the department and candidate on an easy way and a good way? How can we give a candidate a good insight of our company and be really authentic about the culture and the job tasks? There's another part why it's agile in recruiting. It's the point of flexibility and adaptability. So working environments are changing faster and faster due to COVID. COVID is a great resignation. There was something before and there will be something after. And employees are needed now who can keep up with these changes. So they have to be more flexible, more willing to learn and change. And this is the reason why technical skills are moving more into the background. It's always good to have some technical skills, but in a very fast changing environment, every day you need new skills. Things you learned at your university will be outdated in a few years. So you have to be flexibly, willingness to learn, change. A lot of parts why agile is important for recruiting. So you mentioned about, you know, the, first of all, you need to align with the concept of customer, which is in this case is the department who is recruiting or the hiring manager, let's put it this way, and also the applicant themselves or the candidate. I mean, it's given traditionally, we have been focusing a lot on the hiring manager or the team themselves who wants to hire people. But at the same time, I think there are still a lot of variants in terms of focusing on the candidate, not just another person to think, okay, we just hire a bunch of people to our company. So you mentioned the thing, what do the candidate wants? What is the significance of this actually? Like how should we actually start caring about what the applicants want? Because it seems like it's going to be customized towards individuals rather than a generic approach. So it's always the war for talent and everyone is looking for a new employee. So the job market is empty. So you have to focus on your candidates and their needs much more than maybe the needs of your real customers who are buying your products. Most of the companies I talk with have a lot of customers, a lot to do, and no need to find new customers. 
but they can't do their work or can't do new things because of a lack of employees. They wouldn't find new employees. That's one of the biggest things every company has to find new employees, to do more work, to grow, to make new stuff. So you really have to focus on candidates and employees and their needs. It's more important for the future of your company. If you do so, it's necessary to find out how a candidate looks at a recruiting process. Everyone knows the candidate journey, which is related to a customer journey, you know, from a sales cycle or something like that. And you have to present some important information to the candidate at each step of the recruiting process. So the central question is, what information do your candidate need to make a decision to go on with you in your recruiting process? You started with flexible working hours, part of remote work, working from home, but also the insights of the company and to feel involved and social welcome in the company. So how you can manage the whole recruiting process in a comfortable way for both sides. So it seems like if I understand correctly, you also need to understand what are the things that can actually help candidate to make decision to join you. So maybe yeah. giving more insights about the company, the kind of work that they will do, and also the team that they will work with, not just the manager. You mentioned about it in the very beginning, right? The team should be involved in the recruitment process. Tell us more about it. How does this new dynamic plays into the agile recruiting? For example, one big question maybe every candidate will have is, what is my boss like? What kind of person is he or she is? This is a question you normally can't ask in a job interview. Maybe you can ask your recruiter, what's the boss like? If you have a good interview and some trust in the things that go on, maybe you can ask with the HR guy. But in the end, uh, the HR guy does not know how your future boss really is because he doesn't report to this leader. He has another boss he has to report to. Maybe you can ask your boss himself, hey, what are you a kind of leader? <laughs> and he will always say, I'm a good one. And maybe he is. Maybe he's a really fine guy. But how believable will this answer be? It's more authentic and believable if a candidate can ask this question to future colleagues of his team. Maybe the team says something like, oh, our boss, yeah, he can be a little loud sometimes, but in the end, he always is in the back of us and it's a real good boss. So that's authentic. It's believable. The candidate knows, okay, my boss is also a human being and not a holy person. So that's a real authentic insight of the team and of the leadership and also a reach to bond with the team. Because everyone knows a person can be a little loud or be not that nice all the time. That's normal. That helps to connect, which is really important for the next step. So if I can bound with a team and get service, it's that's nice people I like to work with. And I'm happy to see you again in the next round of interview process. Or maybe I get a contract from you. So I'm happy to work with you. Yeah, it's a kind of team building in a very, very few days in the recruiting process. And it makes it harder to quit, to say, so sorry, you're not the right company. I don't like you guys. You actually brought up a very good question, which I'm sure everyone who has gone through the journey of switching career or switching company, the first is always like you want to understand the culture and especially the boss that you'll be working with. I myself will never ask <laughs> probably to the HR or even the team, how is the boss like? But I think you brought up a good point. Like you mentioned a couple of times about authenticity and believability. So being able to share fully, transparently, what is the working culture and the people like in the company. So I think that's one thing that probably we can also try to learn how to be more authentic and share something about the real life in the day-to-day -day situation. Another thing that you mentioned, right? Since this is tailored to skills as well, in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, technical skills now becoming more and more challenging in terms of getting it right, because things are always changing, technology always changing. And you mentioned in the book that we should hire for talent and train for the skills. So tell us more about this concept. I guess it's about something Steve Jobs said, so don't hire smart people and tell them what to do. Hire smart people and they can tell you what to do or something like that. Everything is changing and everything will be different in a month or in a year. So you need employees who are willing to do this change. I'm not sure if you still work with old technology or there's always some people in a company who can't go with the change with the speed it comes, but you have to, if you will survive on a market, you will always have to change to invent yourself, to become a better company, to focus on different problems of your customers. 
So you need people who are willing to learn, who are able to change and who are more flexible. And it's more important than 10 years ago to have employees who can do that. Due to COVID, there are some companies who were very successful in going to the working from home stuff. So they can manage their working process in a very easy way, or maybe it's not that easy, but they were willing to learn it. There are some companies who couldn't handle the thing very well and not sure how that will end for them if there will be an after COVID time sometimes in future. So you mentioned a point where due to like pandemic situation, so working norms change and also technical skills, again, as mentioned, it keeps changing, especially in the technology industry. New technologies are being introduced almost like every few weeks. This actually comes to a concept where you also mentioned in the book or what in the agile world is also widely known, which is called cross-functional team. So to build a cross-functional team, you need more generalists versus a lot of more specialists. Tell us, how do you actually adapt this cross-functional team into agile recruiting? It's a part where the team take part in the recruiting process and it's a cross-functional team with different skills. So they can look for competencies which are missing in the team or which skills are more needed. I use the cross-functional teams just to make clear that it's more important to have the right soft skills, the right competencies, maybe not the technical expert. So if you're looking for an expert for something which is really new on the developer market with a very cool language or kind of development stuff, which is just the thing for now. Maybe it's outdated when the colleague joins the team finally after two or three months <laughs> because nobody cares about this technology anymore. So what will you do with this expert in the technology you don't use anymore? So yeah, this brings a point to the generalists, right? We should hire more towards generalists, although yeah, there are times where you need specialists for sure. Tell us more about the importance of these soft skills now in the company these days. Why are soft skills becoming more and more important versus their actual technical skills? There are some personal skills and some social skills which are learned in the very first years of your life, maybe in your childhood or at school. And that's the basement for the methodological skills, the way how you use your skills to get new language and new skills, the way how you learn new stuff, how you solve problems. If you're able to put your competencies well together to become a fast learner or to become more flexible, you can adapt more things you learned before to fulfill a new task. That's more important than to be a very deep expert in some art. I guess I have to agree there will always be the experts in some things. There's always place for them and I don't like to bash them against <laughs> that hard. We will need them. But we also need people who are flexible, who can change, who can go with the future very fast. So these days, actually, especially in the technology world, hiring is especially challenging. There are so many demands, but not enough good supply, so to speak. Let's say even worse, if you are challenging with the big boys, those big tech giants, where they can offer you not just in terms of challenging work and good working culture, but also a lot of things, benefits and all that. And you mentioned when you find people, you should probably focus on three things. The qualification characteristics, the competencies, and which I would like to ask more is about potential. The third aspect that you mentioned is about potential. First of all, how do you think we can actually assess more on the potential versus thinking too much about competencies and qualifications? Yeah, that's a really good question and hard task to figure out the potential of a person. So many psychological things going on. One of the most relevant thing is to make an intelligent test. It's the most important thing, how you can know how to get something about the potential of a person. So you need a test. Can't recommend that you do an interview on itself. Even if you are really trained in the recruiting as a recruiter or as a profiler, it's hard to get aware of the potential of some people. So you need some really good interview techniques to figure it out. And one of the easiest ways is to do a kind of test. Intelligence of a people is the most predictable thing to find out about the potential of some. An easier way and a valid way is to look at the grades at school. How boring it sounds, but yeah, good grades are a good indicator for uh, intelligent people. You mentioned a couple of times about social inclusion. And in the book, you mentioned something called communication among equals. It seems like there's an equality that you want to put as a message across. What kind of equality that you're talking about? Is it? related to how people are being treated the same uh, across all candidates? Or is it something different? What do you mean by among equals here? 
communication among equals means that the team will develop in the recruiting process. So yeah, as I mentioned before, the question, what will my boss look like? What kind of person he or she is? So to be more authentic on the same level of professionality, if you are a software developer, you will talk to your software developer team, you will work with, for example. So again, the concept of getting the team involved and seeing eye to eye, I think a lot of times I see also recruitment process is kind of like lopsided, especially for companies who are probably bigger. They seem to just, I want to hire and I want to hire, but not necessarily mm -hmm. focusing a lot on candidates experience throughout the interview journey. I think the equality here is more about also treating people as if like an employee as well, probably, and give them the best experience that they can in order to know what is the culture inside the company. Is that the right interpretation? Yeah, I will totally agree. I like to add another point. I guess we missed it a few minutes before. If we involve the team in the recruitment process, we focus on self-organization in the team. So they will be responsible for the hire we will do later. It's a big thing in the agile community to be more self-organization in the team, to be responsible for such a big, important thing to hire a new employee. It's my normal work, things I do every day. As we started with agile recruiting, I was surprised how honored the team was that they be involved in the recruitment process. They really can influence the process and will be integrated in the decision-making process. That's, that's a really big impact. Maybe if we can go through the common traditional hiring process, just go through the journey one by one. It starts with the pre-selection, right? Where candidates submit resume or profiles or even a headhunter looking for candidates that they can approach. Maybe tell us more in the agile recruiting, how this pre-selection process differs from traditional approach of recruiting. First of all, though, that's for all recruiting processes, not only for the agile one. Pre-selection of suitable candidates is hardly possible on the basis of applicants' documents. It's hardly to find any valid selection criteria from the CV and from the web that are really valid, that are really have an impact. We all think if you do sports and if you do a team sport, you will be a good team player. No, there's no valid research that it's true. It's in your head, it's your personal bias, but it's not science and science can't prove that thinking. So there's just a few things you can really read out of a resume. Another point is that applicants know how to write resumes. There are countless books and coaching sessions on the subject of applying correctly. The credibility of application documents is so questionable. Since every applicant is likely to use some strategies to send himself or herself in a really good light to be the best one. In the end, there are just a few things you really can read out of a resume. Maybe that it's the years of profession. If you're doing your job very long, it's better to think uh, he is professional in this part. Good grades are always a sign for an intellectual employee. Therefore, you have not a lot of things you can read out of a resume. You have to talk to people. So you have to do telephone interviews or Zoom calls. In the first step to get a short impression of the real person behind the CV. That's the part where the team, the recruiting team or the team of the department who's looking for an employee can be involved just for a short interview to find some very important facts like the profession or some really important soft skills. If you talk about software developer, I guess it's really common to do a quick coding test, live coding on a Zoom call or to do some bug fixes in the end. And that's the very first part where the team can help the HR. And it's also a great opportunity to bound with the con candidate. So it's the first contact the team and the candidate can have. So they can look if they fit, if they like it, or if it's a good match. So that's the first part where the team can be integrated in the interview process. You mentioned a very important things, right? Because now candidates have a lot of resources, how to improve their CVs, how they improve their profiles. Not necessarily sometimes all truth, probably <laughs> sometimes like it's a lie, so to speak. And also it's very difficult probably to judge from a resume, whether this person is really legitimately great, or it's just like they know how to polish the resume. Talking to the candidate probably is still one of the best indicator. What about if you have hundreds and thousands of applicants when you reach such a scale where you are top employers and people just yeah. want to work with you? How can you do this? Getting a call with everyone. I think it's just impossible sometimes. So if you're one of the happy companies who have 100 applicants for a software developer position, you have to scan the CV for some important steps like 
how many experience you have. You can look at the grades on university. There's some hard facts you can look at. But even if you scan a hundred resumes, you will come at the end to 20 resumes. It's a good decision to get in touch with a candidate and a real person or in a Zoom call to become a better view what the person really like. You can't do that with a hundred, but maybe you can do it with a 20. If you integrate a team, you don't need 10 recruiters. You can bring the stars to the team. That's something in the HR recruiting thing. It's, that's a world of HR change. So it's not that HR don't have to work anymore. The HR owns the process. They really know how a good recruiting process look like. And they improve this process every day to get better and more customized on the needs of the department who's looking for candidates. HR also is responsible to enable the department to do some recruiting stuff. So the department has to learn how to make a good interview, what are suitable questions, how to figure out if a candidate is the team player, is good in discussion with critical customers and so on. So there's an important statistics or maybe research in the book that you mentioned. You said that it is interesting to note that in the case of work experience, diversity of the experience itself is significantly more predictive of the fit and job success rather than just the experience alone. Maybe can you tell us more what do you mean and what do you actually see from research in terms of diversity of experience? If you think about it, it's pretty obvious. If you work as an accountant for the last 20 years in the same apartment, with the same task, you are very expert in this specific thing you do. In this accountant thing, in this company, in this department, in this team, with this task. Also, you can do one thing or maybe two things very, very good. As I mentioned my resume before, I worked in eight, nine, ten different HR positions. So I'm an HR professional, so I guess I can say that after 20 years. But my profession comes from very different positions, very different tasks in the whole HR stuff. So I started with some operational things like writing, job references, job ads, and so on. And in the end, I do some transformation stuff. So my range of HR is much bigger, or the range of things I can do in my profession are much, much bigger than the accountant I mentioned before, who worked 15 years in the same department, the same task, the same team. So it's really important to have some different experience in your own job that helps you to become more flexible or just to stay flexible in your thinking. 20 years ago, as I started with my HR career, I had no idea that I will wrote someday a book about HR recruiting or I have to deal with Scrum Master. But at the same time, also, like some people have the opinion that if you change too much, obviously, like within a year, you change too much. That's also not a good thing. Is that still the case where you want to assess people, at least at minimum, they should stay within a company for X number of months or years? I guess how often you change your job to company or the department. Research and the science, it's not important how often you change. Okay, if you change every three months, I can't believe that you are able to get more professional in a job because you're always in a change process and never in a working phase in your life. But this part of, oh, that's not a good candidate, he or she changed his position every two years, every 18 months. It's something in the head of the recruiter. They think so, and I don't know why. Or maybe they're afraid of, if I hire this guy, he will leave me at 12 months. Maybe that's where it comes from, but there's no evidence that it's not a good person. So if you will fulfill the needs and the thinking and all things of the people who do the selection process, you can think about how long you stay in the job. But if you're lucky, there will be some HR people who are more educated in the things and know that it's not important how long someone stays at the same company. So if you are a software developer and change every two years the company you work for, and there's a good story behind it because you develop yourself and every change, every step you made, that's a great story. So if you come from a junior to a professional to a senior, just to get more deep in some special things you'd like to program with, to work with, that's fantastic. If you just do some random bits and go to a new job and there's no good story behind, maybe it's a little questionable why you did that. Maybe you're really not a good employee and every company knows it 10 months after hiring you that you're not that good. <laughs> so you have to quit. Yeah, I know it's very tough to actually gauge a candidate, their potential or their true quality attributes from just a few rounds of interactions. But nevertheless, after the pre-selection, we have to do the interviews. So do you have any tips what Agile Recruiting probably advises how we do the interview process itself? As I mentioned before, you have to look at competencies. 
it's harder to make question which focused on competencies. And in my book, you will find some questions, techniques, which are easy to learn and really helpful. It's an easy one with the low hanging fruits and you get making a big process in learning. So it's always wrote in a style how HR can train the skills to a team who is not used to make interviews. Yeah, I'm not sure if you talk about some specific techniques or just good to know that there are some easy things to learn. Maybe we can go through some of the techniques that you mentioned that HR can actually train people for all of us here, recruiters or people who need to do interviews, maybe a few techniques, what they can experiment, maybe how they do interviews in order to assess candidates' competencies better. Okay. First of all, it's about the unconscious bias. So you always have some thinking in your head about people, even when you look at the photo, the name or the first impression. You have to be aware that this first impression of a photo of a person of a name is not valid for the final decision if it's a good or a bad employee. There's never be a bad employee. All employees are good. The question is good for which task? What are the good tasks for this candidate to work on? That's something I guess the most of recruiters and HR people learn at university in their life, how important it is to be aware of their own bias. You have to train that or train that to the department that they be aware of about their own biases. And then there's a technique I like because it sounds much better in English than in German. It's a Susie ball. It sounds kind of funny. It's a way how you can find more about some specific behavior and the competencies behind. It's an acronym, SUSI ball. It starts with an SU, SU. SU stands for suggestive statement. Maybe you will find out how a candidate deals with a critical situation with a customer. That's the topic. It's not easy to ask because if I'm a good applicant, I will never have a critical situation with a customer. I've only had P customers, the happiest customers alive only with my work. So I start with a question like, I guess there will always be some customers who are not as easy to satisfy. Do you know such a situation? So I offer the room. So I know as an interviewer, there will always be some customers who are not satisfied. Let's make it easier for the candidate to say, yes, I know the situation. And it's pretty obvious. Everyone was in such a situation. That's the entrance and the real technique. So when the candidate says, yeah, I know such a situation. Now you can ask, oh, you know a situation. Please tell me something about this concrete situation of your past. So now the candidate has to tell you something about this situation. It's a concrete situation as a situation. We're going to the really important part. We ask a lot of questions about the behavior. How do you deal with this situation? You don't ask a lot about the concrete situation. What kind of a customer was it? What did go wrong? What were the reasons? No. You ask about the behavior. How do you deal with it? How do you fix the problem? And so on. That's the most important thing to ask them questions about the behavior. Mm -hmm. Because that gives you a clue about the competency how a candidate deals with critical situations, critical customers. So it's a B for behavior. If you're done with the behavior, you come to the O for outcome. What was the outcome? It's just a question. So how does the situation end to close this really great big range of questions you had before and to make the conversation more on point in the end before you go to the L for learning. So what did you learn about the situation? What did you learn for the future? How will you handle the situation if you can start from the top? So that's the L. The Susi Ball or Susi Ball, it's an acronym for a really easy loop to learn how to ask about competences. It's really easy to prepare these questions before an interview. So you can write some questions down at the Susi Ball technique and this logic and ask the candidate about it. Thanks for sharing this. First of all, I've never heard about it before. Is Susi ball, right? It starts with a su, which is suggestive. And then C, which is the situation itself. B-O-L ball starts with the behavior and then outcome. And then the learning from the candidate out of that situation. So after we've done the interview, of course, the important process in the recruitment is actually onboarding when the candidate actually joins the company and starts. But actually, that's what our interpretation about onboarding, right? When the employee starts. But you brought a point in your book that actually Onboarding starts even from the first contact between the applicant and the company. 
So tell us this interesting perspective from you that actually onboarding starts from the first time you had a contact with the candidate. If the applicant or the candidate get in touch with the team, maybe in the pre-selection files and the interview, and maybe they only have a coffee for a social interview or something like that, there's a kind of team building process going on. The team gets to know the candidates, the candidates get to know the team and the idea of each other, general feeling if they like each other, it's a good fit or not, what things a new guy could do, which things a new guy shouldn't do. Some thinking that starts in the head of the team and also in the candidate, because the candidate also thinks about how well will I fit in this team, what task will I really good at, and what task maybe will be ended at a colleague and not on my table. So it's a really kind of onboarding or team building at the very beginning of a recruiting process. The whole process starts again when the candidate finally comes to the team on his first working day, for sure. But this process shortens. I'm not sure if you know the Tuckman model of team building. It's, it's about storming, forming, performing phases of a team. We will get faster and productive employee because of the team building process shortens a lot. But it can shorten a lot, depends on how well you involve the team. And that's also another point. I guess I mentioned it a little bit before. If you involve the team in the recruitment process, the team shares the responsibility for the selection decision. So the interest of the team in training the new colleague is many times higher than if the new employee is simply presented by the boss. Because it was my decision as a team to put Henry on my team. So I feel responsible that Henry would feel welcome to be well trained, to become productive in a very short time. And so that's also something that it's good for the self-organization of a team. So the onboarding starts from the very first contact between applicant and company. Maybe you do something like in a mentor program where we just present in most of the companies. And you also brought a point where even after the candidate signs and they said, okay, this will be my joining date, you should not lose contact with them in between that transition period after they yes. sign and they are start of the new company. You should probably keep them warm, maybe. What will be some of your tips in order to keep this engagement continue? It depends on the team and maybe on your company what's suitable. It can be a very long time from signing the contract to the first date. In Germany, it's often three months or something like that, because that's the normal period of time. Stay in touch with your candidate. So maybe you can invent him to team events, to some important things that will happen in the time before he starts, where he or she can be involved with, could start with a beer or a coffee in the after hours or some job events. Figure out what things are possible in your company and don't leave your new colleague alone for three months. That's not good. Thanks for all this overview of the process from pre-selection interview and up to the onboarding. So hopefully everything's going to be okay once the candidate joins. Unfortunately, due to time, we need to end this conversation. But before I let you go, I have one last question, which I always ask to all my guests, which is to share what I call three technical leadership wisdom. So probably since you don't come from technical background, it's also <laughs> to have three recruitment leadership wisdom. So maybe if you can share some for us to learn from. I'm not sure if I have three, but there's one thing I really like to share with all leaders in my trainings. Something I try to get across in every one of my trainings is that no employee gets up in the morning to do a bad job. No one thinks today I'm going to do my worst. Today I show my boss all things I can do wrong. So I'm a really bad guy today. No of the employees think like that. Nobody. Even if it sometimes feels different. I know maybe all leaders will have some guy, maybe he gets up every morning to be a pain in the ass. But even if it feels different sometimes, you must not forget that everyone wants to give their best. Everyone wants to be part of something and feel that they are effective. That's something that's in every human nature. This is then also for me the most important insights for managers. So that's my most leadership tip. The most central task for leaders to derive from this is to enabling others to perform. So if you're a leader, you have to enable them to perform. If there are any boundaries, any things you struggle with, you have to clarify the working environment to make others perform. That's my most important leadership tip. So thanks so much for reminding us again about this importance that nobody within your company or in your team wakes up just to screw you, so to speak, right? Like wakes up and decide, okay, I'll do a bad job today. 
everyone will have this conscious mind to say that I want to perform and do something good. But yeah, circumstances could happen that they somehow did not perform. But that doesn't mean that person itself is not a good employee for you. Thanks for reminding us that. So Jens, it's been a pleasant conversation. If people want to learn more about your HR recruiting or even buy your book or want to continue the conversation with you, where can they find you online? The most important thing will be LinkedIn. So even in German, my last name is unique enough. Maybe there are two Jens Euberlink, but I guess there's only one related to HR. <laughs> so I guess you will find that. And my book is available on Amazon and all other online dealers where you can buy books. So I guess it's pretty easy to find me in the internet. Feel free to contact me. Unfortunately, my website, Läuft.io, it's with an umlaut, which is in German. So feel free to have a look at it, but there's no English version for now available. But if you like to contact me, feel free. And maybe you can share my contact details in your podcast description or something like that. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for explaining to us what this concept of HR recruiting And I wish you good luck in all your trainings to the companies who need to know about these incredible techniques. So thanks again, okay. Jens, for your time. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for listening to this episode and for staying right until the end. If you highly enjoyed it, I would appreciate if you share it with your friends and colleagues who you think would also benefit from listening to this episode. And if you're new to the podcast, Make sure to subscribe and leave me your valuable review and feedback. It helps me a lot in order to grow this podcast better. You can also find the full show notes of this conversation on the episode page at techleadjournal.dev website, including the full transcript, interesting quotes and links to the resources mentioned from the conversation. And lastly, make sure to subscribe to the show's mailing list on techleadjournal.dev to get notified for any future episodes. Stay tuned for the next Tech Journal episode. And until then, goodbye.